So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is the long awaited, for us anyways, four months in the making, the long awaited uh, History of Quebec and Canada Teacher Toolkit. Uh, I wish I could have found a, 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 fun, a funner name, <laughs> but I mean, it is a toolkit, so might as well call it that. And we will have a big file, okay, a zip file that will be uploaded on the Age Resource website and also available to each participant uh, as we're just going to give you the link to it. And inside the big folder, we have set, we have eight files. And in each file, you have different types of documents to hopefully help you plan uh, for the upcoming history. Uh, program implementation. So separately and entire context uh, content as well. So that's the material, the, the little thingies that we needed out of the way. So uh, we are now ready to begin the actual presentation. So there are going to be four presenters, as I said, back and forth, going back and forth between uh, between each of them. The first one, Emily Bowles, uh, our consultant at Reciage. Uh, we also have Alex Prince, who is a history teacher at EMSB. Paul Rombo, who is a consultant at Learn Quebec. And myself, Julie Robitaille, consultant for L'Equipe Choc Pedagogical. So each in our capacity and our specialty, we are here to present the material, but also there to help you once the presentation is over and you, if you need more of our help. So we're going to be available. You're going to be able to reach out to us. You're going to have our contact information at the end of the presentation. The objectives uh, for today's presentation are very simple. We want to present resources and tools that we have developed in line with the new History of Quebec and Canada program of study. We want to share our expertise and provide guidance as much as we can and provide assistance in the implementation and the creation of pedagogical material and assessment tools. And that, of course, is an extension of today's presentation because there's not, none of that can be done in two and a half hours. So that third bullet is really the extension uh, to what we've prepared. As I said earlier, we're, we've started preparing this in January. And my colleagues, Emily and Alex, were awesome. Uh, they, we spent lots of time developing, talking, uh, reflecting. And I think we've put together uh, quite an extensive amount of material for you to use. Of course, we are not going to be upset if you use only a little bit of it or if you decide to change part of it. This is all going to be editable and you can then leave with it and use it at will. And of course, ask for our help if you need it further down uh, the uh, preparation for this course. So the breakdown of the presentation will be uh, as such. As you can see here, part one is entitled resources. We have part two, curriculum planning tools. We will have a short break after. And part three will be what we call supporting learning. So part one, resources. Before Mr. Rombo um, speaks to you about the Learn Quebec resources that he's uh, developed and updated, I want to make sure that all of you have um, We'll do an overview of everything that's already available, that resources that are already out there for you uh, to look into. And you may have already, all right? So other than the program and the, DD, the DED, what else is there that you may have seen or that you will be looking into? So the first thing, of course, uh, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir, but you know that the Kipchak Pedagogical has a website, uh, the Age Resource website. Um, a lot of our dossiers have been up, updated, and the history has been one. Of, it's one of them. In there, you have material, you have the documents from the ministry, and you will see that as we go, we update and we add material. And 
today's presentation, all the, everything that we're providing is going to be up there uh, in the next few days. As well, you have access because you were, uh, we sent it to you, but it's out there if you need it. Uh, you see the presentation of the history program that we did in December of 2021. If you remember, you very likely were in attendance and it was the translated version, if you will. We had adapted it somewhat and it was the English version of what the ministry had presented in October. So that is still out there available to you. It's going to be in the chat as well. It's in PDF form and you can go and take a look. In there, there's valuable information about the evaluation process, the intellectual operations, how the, the, uh, how the program has changed, the shift that has happened. So it's all there as well. As well, on our age resource website, you have Alex's um, spreadsheets. Okay, so the course content, uh, Alex has generously provided us with uh, a very extensive uh, spreadsheet for today's presentation and the other three courses will have the same spreadsheet and it's going to be up on there. S right now you have some material, it's still valid, but the updated versions are going to be simplified a little bit and are going to be uploaded uh, very, very soon. Then you have already Emily's resources for History of Quebec and Canada. I think it's a five or six page document uh, where you have several, several, several resources that exist, whether video, website, documents, uh, everything that you can possibly think of. And of course, broken down into uh, several subjects. And this is an excellent res uh, resource. It's already out there. You have the link for it as well. And we made sure to remind you that Paul's presentation at a summit last March is also uh, available. So the presentation was about UDL in social sciences. Uh, so it is a resource that already exists that's already out there. I don't know how long I've been speaking for. I think I'm within my allotted time. Uh, but if, if all of this is clear, then it is my, it's time for Paul to take the floor and to present the resources that are uh, on LEARN and that he has worked very, very hard to prepare for you. So, Paul. The floor is yours. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of context for the site I'm going to be showing you and uh, refer very quickly to the program. Uh, uh, basically, I'll just say who I am. Paul Rombo. I'm a consultant at LEARN. I was a teacher for 10 years in the north and around Montreal. And um, now I'm basically in charge of uh, doing workshops, but also mostly uh, collecting resources and developing resources. And those are my contacts. So um, I want you to keep something in mind. The program as it stands now is a chronological program, and it's basically the same history that the old program did. In other words, you know, the past didn't change that much. The way we look on the past may have changed in the way we organized it. And uh, basically, you're going to be, you know, describing what's going on in periods. And uh, so that's the, the what, the where, the who, and you're going to be analyzing social phenomenon. Uh, as, as we go through those periods. So those are your two courses. That's the second, uh, sorry, that's the, I guess the third and the fourth course. And time flows down this, this way. Now, before I show you my site, which is structured basically around time, simple, right? I wanna remind you that there is another site, the elementary site, which is also structured around time, which contains a lot of resources uh, for the societies in the elementary sector including ones that parallel the secondary sector, like, for example, the Iroquoians, the New France uh, section, the Lower Canada section. Um, some in Quebec 1905 has industrialization as well. And each of those sections has about 20 pages. And on each of those pages are texts and about five documents each. So there's really like, there's a, something like 4,000 documents on that site that are at a different reading level. That's the basically very similar content but it's not exactly the same content. So we uh, were inspired by this because it's a very popular site. 
And uh, I wanted to bring all the documents out of, of the closet that we've been working on, the resources, and put them into a student-friendly space like that. And it's, it's in progress right now. We're sort of about a third of the way through transferring things over. But as you can see, it's structured by time. I started with secondary four, which for you would be the, the last two courses, I guess. And uh, you can see that there's 1840 to 1896 and left to right are time sections and similarly at the top. And I've started to move over the, the secondary three time periods as well to this site. So before we actually look at it, I just want you to, I want to describe a little bit how we structured this site. Keep in mind, it's a student content site, but I'm putting the teacher materials there as well. So um, this is uh, the program, right? The program, when you hit a time period, you hit descriptions, you hit timelines, and you hit content knowledge. And I put this up because I, I actually did a workshop last week and I forgot to put up the description. When you're doing, when you're teaching and you're working on trying to figure out an essay questions, you shouldn't forget the description. And when we think of big questions, we often look back at the description, but the site itself is, is structured more around the knowledge and how the knowledge is divided up. And it was set up so that, so that you can sort of pick off all the knowledge elements. Each one of these knowledge elements has like four or five bullets to hit. And those are present in the spreadsheet that Alex did as well, I believe. So basically when you see a page on the site, and I'll jump in in a second, I want you to see what's up top is the knowledge that we've targeted on that particular section. So these, these points are student-friendly sentences that come right from the program. So if you're doing the act of union, these are, these are bulleted points. And that's the knowledge that's being developed. And then there's knowledge, there's documents down below and a quite a long page. Um, but I don't know if you, did they show you this one in the workshop? This sort of weird loopy diagram yes, that scares mm -hmm. a lot of people? Well, it's mm -hmm. not, don't be too scared by it because really the important things are time periods, the who, what, where, and social phenomenon, the why, and what changed, what didn't. And this takes place in a sort of a subtle way on the site. If you look at the, the uh, targeted knowledge, the way it's structured is some lend themselves to competency one activities, describe, identify, and there's usually one, at least one, that's the competency two element. So as you do it, going through the content, I mean, I don't put C1, C2 on it for the students, right? But the way it reads from top to bottom is usually competency one documents and then competency two uh, type of issues or questions even. And the way the site is structured is that there's knowledge up top, like I just said, and there's documents. So these are basically documents down below. Documents could be text, they could be images, uh, they could be videos. There are documents that can be analyzed. And I'm gonna show you this one. You mentioned the UDL one. I'm gonna mention this one a little bit further, further uh, later because especially the Irish one has the example of the UDL uh, uh, guide that I worked on in the video. But basically, you can see that as you go down a page, you have sort of uh, explore further, uh, ranking causes, and then consequences of the Irish immigration down below another activity. So the C2 stuff comes a little further on. So um, before I jump to the site, though, at the bottom, you're going to see these. These are document collections. These are curated online materials that you can click through and find other many, many more than I have. I have about for each page, there's like 40 pages of these types of things. And a lot of Alex's uh, spreadsheet will link to sections of this. Um, and they're really meant for teachers, but you could send students to them. All I wanted to remind you was that it depends on what they're doing when they get there. C C1 type of documents are in there, but C2 type of documents. And sometimes a document can be used for either. It tells who and what, and where and why, but it also, brings up an issue that you have a question to answer for. So I'm just gonna to jump to the site. So basically, uh, this is how the site's structured. And on the first page are the time periods, and there's a little bit of stuff down below I mentioned in a second, which is a student toolkit. And I threw out some links from other sections of Learn down at the bottom, because basically we're moving everything to a public site. The history of Quebec and Canada, me's uh, private space is no longer after June. Um, so we're trying to make all of our stuff and all of the stuff we've translated from Rassi and from other people. You'll see there's something else here from other different boards. 
um, a public. So basically, if you hit a section like the 1840, you can jump right to the part of the knowledge that you're doing, or you can jump to the page where, or you can get a preview of what's, uh, what's there. And so I'll show you one that I mentioned before. So this is the Irish immigration site. And the way it's structured is, again, there'll be two uh, sort of knowledge elements here. In this case, they're in a different order, explain and map. Maybe I'll switch that around. And then you have also a guiding question. And these often will come from the descriptions. So there's something to focus on, like what drive, what forces drive human immigration. Uh, they're just suggestions, okay? They're just sort of an angle to come in at this from, and they're based on Matt Russell, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, who, who, uh, who teaches this way. And the guiding questions will often link sections together. So why do people migrate might be, uh, uh, thanks, but might be uh, one that goes through three or four lessons, right? Whereas the second question might be more specific and you can of course add questions. And then what happens is content. And the way the content is structured for students, keep in mind, this is supposed to be a student-friendly teach at home type of thing, parents can read it is often like an, an engaged section where they read or do something or watch a video, contextual texts, and then documents that become more, um, more focused on activities. Like this, this is a analyze the image, explore a video with a tool that's provided. And I think it was on Emily's list where, uh, where she linked to a section of my site where it's, it's a workshop section that has learning processes. Like first you engage, then you uh, explore a little further, then you investigate by gathering things. Well, this site is structured that way, but not, you'd have to know it. Basically the greens are content and the darker stuff is the activities. So basically it goes down like this. So I won't, I'll see there's another activity, explore further ranking causes. And so it's, it, it's gonna read like a textbook basically when it's done. Some of the sections are not done, some of them are. So. That's content. And then rather than having a separate place where teachers go, although I'll talk about this in a second, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm sticking what's ever available for teachers down at the bottom of each page. I don't mind if a student sees it. There's nothing uh, hidden there. It's a guide uh, for an activity. But I suppose if you were a parent, you could maybe read what to do first, second, third, and fourth, and you could actually do it. And this is the one I showed at the UDL thing where each section is actually broken down in how I engage, how I present the right materials, what they're actually doing. And the UDL presentation refers to this document, which if you open it as a Google slide has the UDL stuff to the left of the slide mm -hmm. that you can use as pointers. And I had to redo this actually, because uh, just after that slide, because I realized that I hadn't quite done this, these other ones right. You really have to sort of follow the UDL guidelines, uh, which is on the side of the document. And yeah, sorry, University, Universal Design for Learning. I'll just show you just quickly. If you ever open up that link, it's over here. So it's sort of hidden there on the side. It's a template and there's a blank one at the end of it. So it helps me sort of remember that I've always got to think about how I'm, how I'm engaging, how I'm representing, how I'm action expression and so on, how, what they're actually doing. But these, these are different depending on which phase you're at. That's what I wasn't, wasn't quite sure of. When you're internalizing, when you're investigating, you're doing different things here. So take a, take a look at that and you can browse through this. But, um, but yeah, the, 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 when you see one like this, a UDL version, it's not necessarily up top. The top was the first run. And then the UDL version is thinking of other options, other ways to package the same content and hopefully it'll get above. And then you get this. The main document collection, which is where everything that was used to build this page and more gets stashed. And the reason why these weren't public before is basically to do with copyright. Now I'm kind of saying, uh, you know, they're they're okay. <laughs> you know? But uh, when you, I'm working on copyright problems right now. If it's really really bad, I won't put it up there. But basically, you've got the same learning intentions at the top, where it fits exactly in the program. And so, yeah, so Alex's spreadsheet might link right to this one, right? If he's in that bullet, he might link right to this document. If, he, if, if, he, if, if one of his resources is this, this just tells you how to get back in case you came here first. 
And there's different activities suggested at the top. And if you scroll down, eventually you hit these sort of, uh, where is it? There, documents. So these are the documents available. So these, these are for teachers. You know, you can copy and paste what you, what you want to use uh, out of them. And uh, I just had a, a great session. Well, I thought it was great. Uh, yesterday, uh, two days, last week, last week, where is your workshop here? Where we worked on um, the intellectual operations and specifically we worked on things like the short answers, short answer questions. You could have a question about timeline. You could have a question about, uh, you know, uh, established connections between facts. You can have eight competency and competency B short answer questions. And we needed documents. So we would look at things like, uh, like these and we'd say, this works, uh, this sentence works, this image works. And we build documents to documents to write short answer questions. And we did the same thing for these ones. Actually, most of the session was on this one, which is mm -hmm. where you need to describe a period. It used to be a, an essay question. It used to, not an essay, but it used to be a writing question. Now it's just basically fill in the uh, fill in the boxes on the exam. Part B, it's about a third of the exam, where you have a, a topic, in this case, debate between actors, and you have a bunch of documents. And then you have to figure out which documents uh, have to do with this, which documents is the demand made by the employer, which documents are the protect pressure tactic, which documents are these. And so what we did was we used these long document collections and we grabbed pieces from them, from the site, student site to and from wherever, and made about 10 documents that they could use to do a question like this. So if you've never seen these questions in action, it really pays to go and look at some. So I'm going to show you where those are stashed now. Um, on the learn site, these used to be in the <laughs> in the in the um, the history community via the learn site. Now I'm starting to move them over here. So basically, uh, I haven't made any that I remember evaluations. I've just translated from the receipt because they have a translation of every one, and eventually I'll get I'll get around to using them. Uh, to making them. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to be using um, some of the ones that they made in the workshop last week because they made some good ones. Um, so this is what it looks like. So you can get those. Remember, I was in the teacher section of value evaluation and um, you can get these sample questions where they have a bunch of documents. And there's about 10, right? So, um, you know, if you wanted to take this and copy it, and make a, a new version with 10 other documents, you'd have a test or a practice test. So if you're doing this section of the site, I have a section on Indigenous society before 1608, you could grab this evaluation. Right now, I haven't put that at the bottom of my, in the, my section of the site yet, but I will at some point. They're just stashed there. Teacher section, get a, get a handle on what's available. But once you've seen one, honestly, uh, people had no trouble making other ones because all the documents are there. That's what takes the vast majority of the time. The question mm -hmm. is, it takes time too, but I gave them the questions that was already done. And I just asked them to make other documents and they were able to do it in like 15, 20 minutes because all the documents are there. Um, so that's, that's the evaluation section. You can see that below this link, I have it, they're still on the community site, sorry, below the red. And above that, they're all been transferred here. And I've got about, I got about eight other eight or eight to ten others that haven't been posted yet. So in the next in the next uh, you know uh, in the next few weeks, there's going to be a, a lot of evaluation materials. There's a little thing way way up at the top here. It's a little beside the word origins. It looks like a toolbox, and it's called the toolkit. You know, because I didn't have a better name, just like you didn't. Have <laughs> just like us. Uh, mine is like the student toolkit. So I'm throwing things that are that I potentially useful for students, like learns how tos. There's one on interpret a picture that could be good. I've got one on in writing an exam that I'm going to put up from an old thing, but I haven't put it up yet. Graphic organizers. Sure, students can browse through those and use them. They're meant for teacher use, but students could maybe use them to help them organize things on timelines. These are new. Uh, Receipt did these sort of fancy sort of uh, interactive things that you can do full screen and um, where you can see what analyzing documents is. This one is on competency one. This is on competency two. They did about six of them. We're going to translate those. 
Uh, there's another thing they translated on intellectual operations in daily life, sorry, that I translated. Uh, I saw Andrew here, Andrew. I posted Andrew's, um, Andrew's Andrew Dana did some uh, video capsules that are really good for explaining what the intellectual operations are. Uh, I have to double check uh, to make sure they're student friendly. Uh, I think they are though. They are, um, they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I mean like, you know, students use them. I mean, I don't expect students will ever go to this site to tell you the truth, really. It's more like a teacher will go there and bring it and use it for their class. So these are really good, the videos. And then the Rassi, you, you, you said they did, you get a badge. Uh, Rassi also did these badge guides, which I translate translated. Um, so there's these different badge guides where it actually will show you, uh, you know, how to, uh, what the process of uh, how to determine causes. And it's got sort of a guide and it's got some little strategies here. Mm -hmm. So that's the site. We've got do, uh, sections, we've got teacher sections, uh, and we've got a student toolkit, toolkit, toolkit. And there's more than enough to get through the program. Uh, and by the end of the year, there's gonna be a, a lot more. So. Thank you very much, Paul. Right. This is awesome, awesome. I mean, you're going to notice, uh, everyone, that a lot of things will be. I mean, there, we're going to cross over, and we have we found a lot of things on Learn, and we may have other examples that <coughs> that that are built on the same model and so on. But again, we do our best to bring you the most uh, information uh, so that you're ready to. Um, so that you're ready to present and, and prepare your material for the course and so on. So um, we are now at the uh, point where we're going to start talking about the material that we have put together uh, as what, what we call our planning tools. Uh, Alex has just joined us because imagine he was teaching until a few minutes ago. Uh, he's joining us uh, in a few seconds. And the way that we decided to, uh, to put this together was very simple, is that we decided to use 4103 as it was the first course of the secondary four material. And that was what's going to be evaluated by the ministry exam. So we decided we opted for this one. And that's why everything that we refer to, you'll notice, is uh, very likely going to be related to uh, 4103. All right. So I'm sure Alex is almost ready to join. If not, Emily, would you like to start with your material? And then we're going to have Alex jump in. Sure. Um, I just wanted to check if anybody had any questions for Paul before we... For Paul, yes. Yeah. Or are you just too just like amazed by the wealth <laughs> of resources <laughs> that there are for us to pull Lost from? Truck. There's a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> you gotta you gotta wade deep right into the deep end and just keep going until you can't come back because there's like yeah. a lot of things. No need to panic anybody. There's there's no, stuff no, no. for us to use. Gail, yes. you have your hand up. Yeah, it is a phenomenal uh looking website. Thank you so much for um putting everything together in that way. It looks very user-friendly as well. Uh you had said a couple of times, Paul, that you anticipate it will be ready by uh, the end of the year. I'm just wondering what that, can we define that a little more clearly when you see it oh, ready? Ready. It's ready now. It's just that I haven't got all the, all the time periods up there. Like I have, I have a lot of, I have a, each, each of those numbers, there's about eight to 10 sections. So there's like, there's eight sections. So I've, I've got, uh, I've got a lot of secondary three already done as document collections, but they're not as pages yet. And then I've got a lot of uh, at the very end of the time periods for secondary four, I haven't started them yet. So famous last words, there's going to be a lot more by by uh, by the end of the year, but I doubt it's really going to be done by the end of the year. Like it's probably going to be done by the end of next year, hopefully, maybe. But yeah, whatever you can find there is, is good to use. It's done. It's public. And, um, you know, if, if there's things that are missing uh you know that you've seen and you say this would be a great activity i can put it at the bottom for a teacher activity i shared somebody did something for griffin town the other day and i put it on the bottom of the industrialization page as a project you know so there's it's never ending basically it'll 
but uh, yeah, it's about it's about a, like I said, it's about a third up finish, but maybe not. It's hard to tell. Thank something. you. <laughs> That's why I said you got to look and figure out what's there, <laughs> then you'll know. But it's definitely awesome, even though it's not quite finished, as you say. And this is awesome, awesome, awesome work. Thank you very much for sharing with us this afternoon. Uh, Emily, we're going to go with the normal, uh, normal um, uh, agenda. As I can see, Alex has joined us, so you can Hi, present. Everyone. So this, the the you this one is the first part of the the unit plan, and uh, we decided to go into uh, details with the uh, the full uh, planification. So there was in the program there was uh, a suggested structure for um, lessons, and uh, I, I followed that structure. Um, first, you, of course, the course, you have to set a, a duration. As you're gonna see in the unit plan after, um, I divided the course so that the whole, that it fits uh, in, in 25 hours. So this part that, um, that contains three um, subject content uh, parts, is 240 minutes. Uh, so in terms, depending on, on the centers might be two classes. In my case, in the HSM, it's one class uh, that I would go through the whole, uh, uh, the whole content there. So an overview, this one uh, is, uh, you go through all the material that you will be um, going through the, the, the course in introduction. In this case, it's the first lesson from um, it's the first lesson from the, the, the third course. So this lesson requires uh, a little bit of revision from the, the course before. So though, um, though the beginning there, the, the rebellions, Durham will not be part fully of the exam of any evaluation to introduce the course, you will touch it. Uh, you will uh, present it also. So that's why in the introduction, the overview, you see it there. Uh, so the, um, uh, the, 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 the lesson objective there, you will, um, as you're gonna see in the unit plan after, um, you cut the, the characterization of the period in, in parts. And in this part, I chose from 1840 to 1851. Also in, in the program, they, uh, they talk about the broad areas of learning in a way of linking the, the, the material to um, a wider uh, set of, uh, of uh, knowledge. And uh, for history, very often it's citizenship and community life and uh, media literacy will come back. Uh, in terms of cross-curricular com competencies, well, also for, for history, Often your lesson will have to use information and to exercise critical uh, judgment. But there's an, in, in these cross-curricular competencies, there are other competencies that sometimes your lessons, you, you can look at them in the, in the program. Uh, sometimes your lessons will touch uh, different, uh, different ones. So then we have two for, for this uh, specific lesson, we have uh, two specific competencies. Competency one will be, um, compet well, well, this is for the whole unit also. Um, every, every lesson will have a competency one aspect and a competency two aspect. Um, so for this one is a current representation of a period of history and uh, competency two, uh, rigor of the interpretation. So as set in the program for this part, the historical knowledge uh, is act of union, colonial economy, and responsible government. Each, these are uh, main subject uh, content that are chosen directly from the program. Uh, of course, there are more details uh, in each of those. Uh, there's some sub content there. We're gonna look into the details. Uh, there is also a vocabulary uh, that is set for uh, the lesson, um, one a place where I, the place where I, I, I found most of the vocabulary. Of course, there's some major concepts like assimilation and reformists that 
um, that are there in the in the main presentation of the the keywords. But if there is a text in the program that is a summary, and if you go through that summary in the program, uh, there is vocabulary that is relevant there when you built your course. Uh, so the material required here, I, for, for the example, I created a very classic um, lesson, which is um, using maps material, mainly interact, interactive presentation of the teacher. Um, so it's very classic, easy to, uh, for any teacher to relate themselves to. Uh, we've been teaching like that for many years. Um, then if we, let's take a look at the lesson breakdown. <clears throat> So uh, I, I'm, I went into different details here. Um, so the first part would be to talk about a news, the, the classic introduction, you relate the, 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 the content to something that is, um, that concerns the student today. So it, it can be loosely related, but you can talk, introduce with some, maybe five, it can take 10 minutes as a leave this, the, the student express themselves on this modern issue. Um, then, so uh, the competency one question that you will be developing, of course, the, the competency one and two are always, at every part of the course, you're always preparing the students for these competencies, uh, but some, some parts will tend to prepare the students more to the first one. Um, and uh, so when you, you description here of the social political and economic context is of course more the the part understanding and knowing uh, than uh, really uh, prepare for uh, uh, a critical uh, analysis so so you bring the student back to the course and introduce the first competency question followed by an overview powerpoint so um, so you, you you put up the question then you go through with the students and you make a presentation on the content. And then the next part, you let the student answer a more specific questions. Um, that and these questions preferably will explore the intellectual operations that the student need to master once they reach the final evaluation. So, the, the intellectual operations for that lesson I, I said is establishing facts, determine cause and consequence and changes, a change in continuities. So again, you, you um, the, the lesson, I mean, depending on, um, it's, it's possible to have other intellectual operations. It's a, a selection we try from one lesson to the other, it's always better to choose maybe three intellectual operations. And then in the other lesson, maybe use uh, other uh, that you didn't use in the first one. So um, here then let the students express their answers and correct with them. Then uh, the next part would be competency two question. So explain how the rebellion and dram re report led to the act of union. This one is a more, a wider, uh, a wider, uh, understanding of uh, but you know of the, the the subject but it could be also uh, just it could also be uh, understand the cause and consequence here um, explore the second competency question with the students and then let them answer the questions also and then answer these questions and this will be the end of part one let's take a look at part two that will be more on the colonial economy and responsible government. So again, it's a, it's a similar breakdown. So um, first you, um, you, you introduce the, the um, you, talk, you relate the subject with something that's more contemporary. And then, um, uh, then you, you go with a competency one question that you explore with the students, again, going more specifically with one key question, but then more specific questions involving the intellectual operations so that the students are more familiar with them. 
Then uh, com competency two also. Uh, same thing. This one is a wider question. Uh, so this one will require uh, the students not so much to um, to explore as much the intellectual operations, but there are some like identify differences and similarities for this one and establish causal connections. And then at the end of this, I would leave a quiz. Um, not as big, I prepared a pretest, and we're gonna look at, at it a little later, but this one would be a small quiz. I would, it would involve um, maybe one, um, a few intellectual operation questions and uh, one question either it would be um, uh, competency one or competency two, just for a revision of what you have there. So, um, so that's for the example of a lesson. We have another model um, that is empty. So you can use the same model to build other um, lesson. Um, this one is lesson one. In each of the courses, we're gonna have two units. So um, it, for this case, 4103, we're gonna have one unit that will involve 1840 to 1896. Then this, the second unit will be from 96 to 45. Um, so the unit plan is, um, we have two credits for this course. So technically when we have one credit, we generally plan it for 25 hours so that the whole 4103 will take about 50 hours, uh, two um, units of 25. Um, so we can imagine that the course 4103 and 4104 will be given in one class, each taking F um, for a regular adult education uh, structure, we could say. It's about a regular adult education structure maybe is 120 hours or so. So the, the, the both courses will be given into one. So in this one, I, I planned it, this unit, which is F of 4103. I planned it for 25 hours. So again, we have broad areas of learning, cross-curricular competencies, common concepts for uh, the unit and uh, specific historical knowledge. This is all the historical knowledge that you, the subject content that you find in the program. Um, that are listed for um, 1840 to uh, 1896. Uh, then the end of course outcome also from the program. So um, assess the cause of federalism and its consequence for Canadian society. Um, Here's the breakdown that you prepared for, for lessons and the number you. of hours. You have a few so, minutes left until Emily's presentation begins. Oh, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read up. So, we have a total, I divided the course in, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, uh, 11 parts or? Uh, eight. Uh, eight, part, eight parts, mm -hmm. total 22 hours. So there is, I tried to make, of course, sometimes in the program, the, the, the parts are presented, some parts can be easily combined, some not. Uh, so the, the lesson also, depending on how much time, um, how much time you want to uh, to spend on each part. It can change from one teacher to another. This one is a suggestion. Really, uh, I felt that the way we've been teaching now, um, well, mainly the, 40, the, the the exams that we still have, we've been having for 10 years. I, I think that breakdown is, is pretty much the one that we've been using, except of course, for the new subject content. There is new material that we haven't been uh, teaching. So this one I had to fill in. So uh, you see most, uh, most um, lesson are about two hours. Um, I combine some of the things that went well together. If you look at the number one is a combination of three there uh, from the act of union to prime ministers. Uh, you see act of union, colonial economy and responsible government are there. If you take a look at the second one, the creation of the Dominion of Canada. Well, I have British North America Act and the Indian Affairs in the same one. So then some would like to have Indian Affairs later, but then I, I respected the program. I felt that 
maybe it was an opportunity to talk about Indian status as we, uh, um, as the, at the same time as the creation of canon. So it's, um, it's a good example. In the middle there, I, um, I, I defined some, uh, I defined what would be the task here, the subject specific learning objectives. And in the last part, I using the, the, um, the sub content of the subject content in the program, I filled up with the knowledge to be acquired. Okay, so if we go after, you can take a look at that breakdown. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, it's gonna be in the package, that's for sure. And we also have templates that are I'm, empty. I'm, I'm already things. working on a breakdown for the second, the second unit of this course. And following the same model, I'm gonna make the breakdown for all the courses and it will be available for uh, uh, those who want. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much for this uh, Maybe the, portion. The last, page, the last page I left uh, some vocabulary. I don't know if it's if we left it there. The vocabulary, no, okay, we so put it in there are the some, unit. There are some references that the I added one. there that uh -huh. from the spreadsheet and uh, there's some vocabulary that uh, yeah. also is there to help you. Uh, Again, the rationale behind having such a, well, more and more of a traditional uh, format was just to make sure that people could either work from a traditional <clears throat> and maybe build something and have some kind of hybrid and mix and match and then get to a more digital, uh, digital format, but smoothly trying to get people to ease into it. So we kept the more traditional, uh, uh, the most traditional uh, approach. And Alex went that way for that reason. And now we're going to hear from uh, Emily, uh, who's gonna present the other side of that spectrum. Okay, so some of you might've seen this a little before, uh, maybe a time or two before. Um, this is like a sample lesson um, that I created with the help of Tracy Rosen, who's here today, shout out to Tracy. Um, so I wanted to think through how we could teach this new course um, using stations in a history classroom. Um, but for the purpose of this presentation, it could also be a resource that's used to teach history in an individualized setting. So Alex kind of presented a, like a whole class lesson plan, how that would work. And here's um, an idea of how it could work if we're doing individualized um, using some digital tools. So this, um, again, we're looking at the same lesson, um, starting out with History 4103, the first lesson. So it's got a couple of slides introducing the course and how it works. Um, another little slide about the intellectual operations. I linked to one of the documents that Paul had, like a summary of the different IOs. And also a short little thing of what the competencies are to situate the students um, to what's going to be happening in the lesson. And so this is the way that the lesson is meant to be explored. So both everybody um, starts out at the introduction to the chapter content, but from there, they have the choice of what they want to do afterwards. Do they want to practice some intellectual operations? Do they want to take a look, take a stab at those competency questions? Or do they maybe want to have a discussion with their teacher as like a check-in for understanding or um, that kind of thing? Then every, everybody ends the lesson in the same way with a chapter wrap up. And so if I put this in presentation mode, these would be clickable and it would bring you right to that particular section in the slide. So for the chapter content, starts out with the different lesson objectives. So I'll be able to, each um, section of the lesson has a kind of reflection question to start off. And then throughout the lesson, um, I've got a little icon every time a student is going to practice an intellectual operation. I've used uh, some of the graphics that Paul has from on the um, 
the elementary site that he mentioned. Um, and so there's, there's some graphics in there. Sometimes I link out to an external site where students do a little bit of a reading um, in order to answer an intellectual operations question. Or sometimes they need to do uh, fill in different diagrams. And um, in the writing of the text, I made sure to kind of keep the language as uh, low level as possible, um, highlighting the, some of the important information along the way. I made um, different graphics here, um, some of those ones that we see in the, in the different workbooks that we've used. I remade them in Google Draw, actually Google Drawings. Thank you, Paul, for teaching me about that. Um, so that I could have like my own versions that I could edit and play around with. So there we go. That's what all the lesson content looks like. There's different charts um, that I made in, in Excel. Well, uh, student goes through. And at the end of the lesson, I put um, a review video made by the McCord Museum. They have some excellent videos, especially for this last, the last two history courses, they created some excellent videos using a whole bunch of primary sources that really kind of pull some of these things together well. Um, and they're very short too. So that's the, the intro part of the lesson, the intro to chapter content. So from there, like I said, the student picks which uh, station they want to move forward with next. So individualize their whole class, no matter what, they can, they can pick where they wanna move next. Um, so intellectual operations, I prepared um, questions for each of the intellectual operations, as well as a document package to go with it. So the document package uh, just stuck different documents into a nice Google Doc, also made a, a Google Slides version if students prefer that. So the different documents are there with their different references. You get the picture. So with those different questions, the student refers to a specific page in the document package and then answers those different questions. So what are the connections, connections, facts, um, changes, continuities, all of these things. Um, for established causal connections, I also put a little link to um, some transitional words, those are super important for those types of questions when they have to link three different um, events or elements together, for example. Competency station. Again, we're referring back to the same document package that I prepared. So C1, what do we have to do? Uh, we're looking at changes in upper and lower Canada. So they have to fill in one of those beautiful little schemas that uh, Paul showed us earlier and that Julie shared in the, the last history workshop that we did in December. And I stuck in um, an idea of what that rubric is so the student can get uh, familiar with how they're gonna be graded. Ditto for competency two, they have to write a little text And here's that little grading scheme for them there. The teacher station, I really wanted to have an opportunity where uh, the student would be uh, obliged to check in with their teacher um, so that they can um, do a, like a, a check-in. The teacher can see, is the student kind of grasping the content? What are they struggling with? So they can have a chance to chat, but also, um, I wanted to include some discussion questions there to kind of make the history um, come alive in a way. So like active union, um, how can I connect this to the student's life? Like how do we work with people who have different viewpoints than us? That's super important for understanding the active union. How do we think um, today's government, how is the government responsible to the people in today's world? What are advantages and disadvantages of regulating our economy. So kind of trying to connect um, current day or like personal experience to the history curriculum 
in a, a discussion with the teacher. Um, and one of the excellent uh, things that Nancy had me thinking about when I was sharing this the last time, you brought an excellent question, Nancy. You're like, how, uh, how is formative assessment coming to this? How am I gonna you know, get a sense of how the student is doing? So for all of this whole presentation here, um, a teacher could say like post this whole thing to their learning management system. So every student gets a copy and can jump in and annotate and answer all the questions directly within the document. Or maybe, you know, the teacher, you might wanna just put the chapter content that that's kind of like read only that people access, uh, but then everybody gets their own copy of the intellectual operations questions. Everybody gets their own competency one and two. Um, and that's like as an assignment on Teams or Google Classroom. So you are gonna get those back and see what each student did for each of those things. <clears throat> and there's also opportunities too, uh, when we're talking about the uh, document analysis, um, which I'll get into a little bit later to include uh, something like Flipgrid, like a video discussion platform where a student has to uh, like vocalize their explanation, their, their analysis of the documents and how they, they got to the answer that they did. I'll, I'll jump into that a little bit later though. The last little piece of this here is the unit wrap up. So I included a little did you know section uh, some resources to learn more, just in case, in case you have students who would like to do some extra history, if that ever happens. And then a short little reflection. So go back to the learning objects, objectives, make sure that you are able to do those three things that we set out, questions that you have, um, and then how can your teacher support you in that individualized learning that you're doing. To piggyback on what Emily was explaining when she was talking about her teacher station, uh, I will, I'm working right now on a rubric to evaluate conversation slash discussion slash conferencing uh, with regard to the intellectual operations. So soon it'll be put up on the website. And of course, whenever we put up material, we're going to make sure that uh, it's in our newsletter so that you know that there's material uh, up there to look into. I can also send you an email if you want me to uh, reach out to you and let you know uh, if anything new is up on the on the website and find out straight from uh, from me. I can do that as well. All you need to do is uh, send me an email to that uh, to that effect, and I will make sure that you do. But there will be a, a a kind of rubric so that you can change or just use it as is. But it's helping you determine whether a student is scoring a five. A, four, three, two, or one in uh, each of the uh, intellectual operations and when you're evaluating them in uh, a conferencing or conversation format. That may be useful as well. It's coming up. It's also always a work in progress. So we're going to go back to Alex. I'm going to share my screen. Alex, are you good with that? Yeah. And we're going to show you uh, a pretest with a document file that uh, Alex put together for 4103. Uh, it will be shared with you. You will have access to it. And it is modeled after, uh, it looks similar to what BIM, uh, the BIM documents that are put together. So we're gonna start with the pretest uh, format. I'm not, uh, I'm gonna put up the uh, document file later, Alex. So we're starting with, the pretest, okay. the questionnaire. Okay, so first, first this course, uh, 4103, 4104, it will be um, ministry exams. So there's no uh, uh, BIM exams for, uh, for no. this one. But it's formatted, it looks yeah, like yeah. a BIM exam. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, um, I just wanted to mention, the, um, uh, the pretest there is, on, um, is focused on only the first part. So, uh, the 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 unit one that I prepared for um, for the teachers, this pretest is only for unit unit one. So so the first um, maybe the dates on 
at the beginning of the exam, should we change that to be for until 19? Yep, I will, to 1896. Yep, no yeah. problem. We'll change that. Here, I tried to respect um, the DED uh, completely uh, in a sense that if you're going to have a pretest for, um, for each part, each unit, like uh, for until 1896 and then until uh, 1945, then for each of these pretests, you can explore both competencies in your pretest. So, but in the exam, normally uh, the exam will have one, uh, one part of the course will be um, the second, the, the, the part B of the exam does, that does for the first competency will be one part of the course. And the second competency part C of the exam will be the other. So, but for this one to practice, I designed and I will design more pretests like that, that actually um, for each unit of the courses have both competencies in uh, section in the, the, the second and third section. So the first section I designed with um, uh, the first uh, section I designed uh, following the, uh, uh, the, the, the BIM model the, um, and the intellectual operations. Uh, I made, the, um, I tried to select one question from each of the parts uh, when you, you make, if you, uh, uh, you can follow that model if you want to make more pretests. I would recommend looking at all the, the, the parts from the subject content and take, uh, uh, I uh, al alternated from each parts. I took one uh, question or so from each of the parts there and maybe we can take a look. And this is really the usual form of question that is suggested by the DED. So as a first question, the early industrialization of Great Britain led her in the 1840s to push towards international free trade using document one and two indicate a consequence of this change in ideology. So here the student has to write uh, a consequence. Uh, maybe we can go and look at the- I'm gonna show the document file for questions. So there's yeah. a document file that comes with the, the, the question, uh, mm -hmm. the adult booklet. So, so the see, documents would be here. So the two documents, document one and two, give us information on um, the consequence for Canada uh, on uh, Britain embracing uh, free trade. So the student following these two, this one is an easy question, has to write uh, in a sentence uh, a clear consequence of that. And uh, maybe we can, maybe we can, just for this question, we can look at the text that I put Absolutely. There. Here you go. Um, so in the wake of Britain's move to embrace free trade, so. The, the, I selected texts from uh, known professors, uh, uh, well, not Scott W. Uh, C., but uh, Mr. Yendo is a uh, is professor there. And so it's their book that they wrote for um, uh, on history of Canada. So the, uh, I took a part there that was mentioning uh, free trade and I, I, I put it there. So if you look at uh, the information in the first one here, um, the Reciprocity Treaty of 1854 negotiated by British North American governor, Lord Elgin dropped the tariffs on agricultural products. So the, the student has to understand here that one of the consequence can be the Reciprocity Treaty. And in the other text, so um, much of the decline in British demand for grain and timber by 1850s was being offset by the emergence of new markets particularly for wheat dairy products and cell number in the rapidly growing cities of American Midwest and Atlantic seaboard. So again, the consequence is that Canada will turn towards the United States for trade. So the student could understand also from this document that um, he could also understand from the second document that the prices for wheat uh, in Britain and timber were were went down, so they were not as good um, as before. So these two answers could be good for that um, that question. Okay, so we have, I think, eight first questions. Yes, eight questions for the first section exactly. Yeah. With the questions for each. Maybe maybe I can explain another one that has uh, 
Uh, maybe earlier, okay. the question three, I think. Question yeah. three, perfect, go ahead. Okay, so this one, um, this one an easy one. So the British North America Act established a division of powers between the federal and provincial governments. Using documents four and five, identify an area of juridis jurisdiction of the federal and provincial. So there's two documents, the four and five, if we look at them. Here it is. So the student has to identify the one that concerns the federal government and the one that concerns the provincial government. So federal and provincial are not mentioned, but the students has, has to understand that seeing document five, the image, for forest industry, this is a provincial responsibility. And then sec, the description in section 91 is the power, all the powers from the federal government uh, are described here in this part of the British North America. Federal is not mentioned there, but the student has to identify and put the number of the document in the right circle there. So it gives you an, an example of um, type of question following the intellectual operations that you will find. And this is a, an example is pretty close to what you will find in the, the final evaluations there for the course, okay? Let's go to section two to show okay. them the graphic. We will have a series of documents that will have to be placed in the following graph. So the, the subject so chosen here is the national policy. So the protagonists, we should have a document here that uh, the protagonist, of course, the conservatives, Johnny McDonald. I'll show you. We're gonna have a document. Yeah. So section two, here yeah. are the so, document files that go with it. So, so there's a series of documents there for section two. Some are uh, unrelated. So the student has to select the right ones that are related to the subject. We have a total of one, two, three, eight documents. I think we have 10. 10, so the student has to select six of them for the graph and discard four of them. <laughs> and uh, I mean, we're not gonna go through the details, but if we looked at it, you see some are, each documents have or fill uh, some of the blank spots on the scheme there. Mm -hmm. There it is. So yeah. once all of that is filled, as Paul showed in his examples, uh, that's the second question. That's the new type of evaluation. Instead of having to write text, they fill in a diagram with the, the help of a document file. Teachers can expect some, so something similar, the final evaluation. Yeah, exactly. And then section two, you have your rubric, of course, that is taken from a ministry document that I'll show you. And that's part of your package as well. And then you have section three. Okay, so this one, I, I kept it uh, maybe a bit simpler than the actual uh, final exam will be. I gave uh, for this one, the subject, first phase of industrialization, two aspects, the rapid urbanization and working conditions. If you go to the document file, I put two documents there, yep. on which the student, uh, the students have to elaborate. Uh, so the first one really talks about working conditions. I took it from the, you see these two I, I took from um, the bo books that we've been using a lot. So uh, the, the, the teachers will be familiar with them. So the um, the one, uh, jo Stanton Joanne, we don't see her name so much, but it's the, the book that, from SOFAD. So probably many of you have, so I felt there was a good text there that described the working conditions in document 26. And then document 27 is actually comes from uh, a, a book that uh, we've had for so many years uh, from Maddock that, uh, I, I, that describes the, um, well, the, uh, the conditions in the working class districts. So. So this, from there, I mean, of course, the students will have to elaborate. Here, this last question could there could be more um, uh, th there could be more details on um, more documents. Okay, so maybe four to six documents would be uh, better. I left the I left it simple uh, with two documents that just give it a guide. But, but so, we could expect. You're right, Alex. We could expect. Yeah. Several, uh, three or four yeah. more. At the final sure. evaluation, you can expect the uh, six document, four to six documents there. Mm -hmm. So also, this this table is for the plan. 
Um, and then... And by the way, it's not evaluated in the ministry exam, as it was explained uh, in December. The plan is not evaluated. It's the 150 word text that is. And then, so the final version would be the only thing that you evaluate. It's highly encouraged to fill the plan, of course, but the plan is not evaluated. You, uh, it's only the final version of the text that is. The, the, at, at least I find with this pretest, the, 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 um, the students, um, I mean, the, the teachers know what to expect and uh, they can maybe prepare the students better, but there's, expect a lot of those texts. Yeah, I saw it was mentioned in the, in the, in the chat, small texts, you know, if, like four sentences or so, and to, to look for key um, information, also images, but I didn't okay. put, uh, maps could be there also. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I noticed that um, is when there will be questions um, uh, to situate, one of the intellectual operations is to situate in time and space. Well, think of these questions, uh, inside the time frame that you are teaching in a sense that the way the exams will be made and if you look at the ded the, you're not going to have as an example to put in chronological order a uh, um, the uh a the, royal list government, the, the royal government with um i don't know the 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 act of union and british north america the the they will the when you have to to um, situate in time and space, it would be in the in the one unit only. Same thing with uh, chronological um, chronological questions will refer to only one part of the course. So you're not going to travel from two parts of the course. So this will make it maybe a little bit harder and more specific. And when it's time to uh, place documents in order in chronological order. So Alex, do you mean like in a timeline, you wouldn't see stuff from 4102 if you're in 4103. It'll only be exactly. from that specific, exactly. even just yeah, exactly. that, that and, first and it, part of the unit. And it will even be divided in the two units. So exactly. if you're in 4103 and you're in the first unit of 4103, your, 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 your situate in time and space should refer only to this part. Yeah. Okay. And uh, William has another question. Now on the exam, um, when we have a question that goes along with the document, will the question say go to document one or document two? Good. Yeah, Good. Always. Always, uh, always. They won't have to hunt for the document. Yes, absolutely. When we when we presented the um, the program in December, we had to make sure that it was very clear which questions you had to discriminate and then remove some of the documents and which you had to use all of them but every single time a question is formulated you always have the number the document numbers that refer to it student doesn't have to look for a whole lot of, and it's separated this way in the pretest to show how it's modeled after what you could expect so it removes a little bit of anxiety when a student has seen the format and is now faced with the exam the one that counts but has seen this before. So it's it, that adjustment doesn't have to be done the morning of the exam. And that's okay. what we were looking into. We wanted to make sure that the, the, the format, the rubrics, that it had been seen before. Since this is new to teachers as well, then we tried to do our best to put together a pretest that would look somewhat like a, a real exam. Okay. Will we see when the exams are done? Will we see the exam before we start teaching the course? Oh, we won't. Eh? So we teach the course. Exam, no, no. If it's a ministry exam, no, for sure. Well, see, at Cartsy here, we've had the same exam for twenty years. Actually, since nineteen ninety-five, so twenty-five years. Yes. So, now we have new exams coming up because okay. there's the, the new way to evaluate. So, it's, so you'll have it, seen them once you've passed. once you've presented them to students, you'll be familiar with them. But the format that we're using in the pretest shows a little bit of how okay. it's going to be put together. So they're going to repeat the same exam every year. There are going to be some uh, a few versions of it. I, okay. I, I think it's three versions that are being okay. produced. 
Is it um, now, is the government going to say, okay, this year we're giving version one, next year we're giving version two, or are they giving all, this, all the versions all at once? I know that there are three being produced, but the way that they are going to distribute or, or assign that is, uh, we're still a little bit in, uh, in a gray zone, but we're, we're expecting information soon. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, and I think Gail. Any other questions? To that. Yeah, that the 4103 and 4104 are already, should be already in the center, uh, different versions. 4101 and 4102, I believe there will be uh, three versions or two versions at least. There are three of the SEC3 as well, yes. Gail, do you have those? We have received one version of one course today. Okay. So that's interesting to hear though. I see other people are saying like, Nicole, you're saying you've received A, B and C for 4103 and 4104? not positive which versions we have but i know we got 03 and 04. all uh okay not, so i have no clue how many versions yet okay. gail we're, we're okay. waiting on printing yeah. thank you so this those two documents will be in your bundle so you'll be able to reproduce the model if you are putting together uh pre-tests if you like the model of course uh, you may choose otherwise it's going to of course be your decision um, if i'm not mistaken it's now my turn we are in part yeah. three part three is supporting learning we called it supporting learning uh, because we uh we're really going to show you as much as we can material to help you out or or programs to help you out or you know things online to help you out and so on and so forth so um Somebody, William, I think mentioned uh, Google Drawing and all that, that it wasn't necessarily easy. Google Docs were not necessarily very simple and so on. So I have started to learn different things out there. So I know, uh, I know it's possible <laughs> and I'll show you. Uh, I have videos also that I was able to get. So let's start with, um, first of all, um, the rubrics that we keep presenting you, that we keep showing you, to uh, in the in the uh, in Emily's document, there were many of them. Uh, in the pretest, there are also many of them. Since the documents are public, it's okay for us to do that. Uh, we have in our bundle a a file that's called Ministry Documents, and in there you will have not only the DED and the the uh, the program, but you'll also have all of those rubrics. Uh, and you'll be able to get familiar with them and get your students familiar with them because they will be, you'll have them, they will be available to you in the document. The first thing I want to talk about uh, is taking, and the two things that I'm talking about for the first uh, 10 minutes or so are things that are taken from ministry presentations that have been either that are going to be used as such or that have been changed somewhat. I'm gonna go straight to La Phrase Histoire. So I'm gonna open La Phrase Histoire. If you, were, um, if you were at the presentation on December 2nd, you probably remember us talking about that. Um, it is coming from uh, La Commission Scolaire des Découvreurs in, uh, in the Quebec region. Uh, Sylvain Bilodeau and Daniel Desrochers have put together uh, La Phrase Histoire, which is an approach to uh, writing uh, or reading statements or documents to help you uh, get a better sense of what the material is and what the, 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 the message is and get the most out of it. And I'm not gonna go over every single thing that they had explained because you, you're getting this document anyways. And it's also in the presentation that you are getting in the, that is available for uh, for you since December December 2nd, sorry. But the phrase histoire is basically, if you remember, it looked somewhat like this. It looks something like this. You have the source, the intention, the subject, the time, the location. And you could, from a document here, okay, go and decide or, or try to locate what the time was, the location, the subject, the source, and so on. And with the help of la phrase histoire, make sense of what you had, but also produce your own. And the third part was, 
If you use la phrase histoire to produce your answer to a question, then using the same model, source, intention, subject, time, and location, you could put together a complete answer. So this is la phrase histoire. I think it's very useful. Uh, and especially if you start using it early on, so 4101, start using that. It's an, another way of formulating, but it is the chart itself and the visual really, really helps those that need those graphic organizers to be able to make sense of their ideas. So la phrase histoire is going to be in your package. And also I used another document that was given to us at one of those. It's, uh, I called it now the complementary or supplementary teaching resource and analysis table. And this was taken from the financial education presentation uh, where they had a grille d'analyse didactique that was meant to analyze whether or not documents or material taken outside of the material you have, for example, if you use SOFAD or whatever, uh, if they were aligned with the program, aligned with the competencies, the knowledge and so on. And if you could, by using such a table, if you could check the boxes and determine whether or not this is a good resource. So the idea is very simple. I went to the ministry, to the program of study, so POS here, as you can see in the little detail box right there. I went to the uh, I went to the program and I just went and said, okay, part one, this is what it is. Here's the historical knowledge that is listed in that part one, and under each you have. Now the details here that doesn't say much, but if you go to the the, the ministry document page 90, you will see this, okay? So this is the ABCD that you have you, in you, the chart. You're only seeing um, your Google Chrome window. We're not Oh, you do? You okay, that's too bad. Wait. Oh, that's because I, can, I have to share. Okay, I'll stop sharing after and I'll show you the, sorry about that. So you have it here. You have your knowledge the details, which is everything that is that falls within that, that knowledge and the references here to the document, the ministry document. So you can check boxes, highlight whatever you wish. And sometimes your supplementary or complementary material will really come in to just touch upon one specific thing that you're not absolutely sure under your students understand or that you really want because you don't think that the material you have is enough or sometimes it'll stand alone and that'll be the only thing that you bring in because you decided to just leave the book on the side and bring something different from the outside. So this here is again, a tool to help you. By no means are you, uh, is, it, this is not mandatory by any means. It's another tool that you can use. And if we go a little lower to the bottom of this page, you'll notice that there you have the alignment with the program of study. So here you can check whether or not they are aligned with the course objectives and with the key features and the what they call the manifestations. We had a quite a conversation about that earlier on, I remember. And then you can also go to a historical thinking chart from Stanford History Education Group. And that chart helps you see and check whether the historical thinking uh, is also uh, well done, or if you have several. So th these are tools to help you choose material to bring them into the classroom and uh, bring them to complement what you're doing with your students. Okay, so la grille d'analyse, the an analysis table, and la phrase histoire, tools that you can use uh, for a, a supporting learning. Just to show you what I was referring to when I in the chart when it said details, if we go to page 90, under active union in the knowledge section, you had four letters, A, B, C, D. That's what they referred to right here. So the page numbers you have under detail, the P, O, S, and the page numbers, 
that's what they refer to. So you can check whether you have, let's say, active union you wanted. Okay, so this is good. And it talks about A, B, C, D. Okay, so I'm good. This resource can be used. I can use it. Uh, no, there's not enough about the political structure, for example. Well, you then choose to leave it out or use, in, use it nonetheless. So it's really about looking if everything checks, but not about using it as a mandatory tool. Again, this is only to help you uh, select material and so on. So I think we're good. Emily, you can go ahead with your intellectual operations presentation. So <clears throat> here is a little sort of one-stop shop I put together for the intellectual operations guide. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So first we've got a little introduction to the toolkit that we're presenting today, this amazing loot bag with the recording from the December 2nd at PyCool, where there's the whole general introduction of the program and the slides from that. So if you haven't, if you weren't there and you want to check that out, that is there for you. The full toolkit, of course, is going to be available on the AGE resources site in the history section. So uh, this teaching guide, um, here are those seven intellectual operations. Um, there's like no information about the intellectual operations in the actual programs of study. So to find out more concrete information about them, you do need to check out the DEDs um, where they are more concretely laid out. There is also this wonderful explanations of evaluation tools yeah, um, that's the one I was referring to. Perfect. Yay. Yeah, that document that the ministry put together, which has um, the lovely little, uh, can we call this a rubric? These yeah, they call them rubrics. Guides. Yeah, they call them rubrics. Yeah, so these are the same ones that Alex used in his pretests, coming coming from the same place. So different ways to evaluate, situate in time and space, for example. Um, identify differences and similarities, blah, blah. It goes through all of them. Some of them have like a couple of different options. Um, so like determine changes in continuities, for example, like can be uh, like a smaller rubric or a, a little bit, something that's a little bit more complicated. So when we're practicing those intellectual operations with students, it's gonna be super important that we're um, sharing those little grading guides with them. Uh, there's uh, so that they are familiar with how those work. They're similar to some of the ones found in contemporary world as well, if you have taught that course. So teaching the intellectual operations, um, I linked to those explanatory videos that Andrew created. Is he still here? Not sure. Anyway, thank you, Andrew, for creating those videos. He really like walks you through um, each of them um, and gives like lots of different examples, like what this might look like at a beginner, intermediate, advanced level as well. So they're definitely worth checking out. Um, not so I when I rewatch them, I'm not so sure if they would necessarily be student facing. Um, videos, but for teachers, they're excellent. And I've linked to a bunch of the awesome resources um, that Paul um, translated from the Heisitsus and that he created himself. Um, so we've got these ones, <clears throat> um, examples of the intellectual operations in daily life. Um, if my computer would load. So for example, it's this, the whole point of these is to make the intellectual operations, help students understand that these aren't just um, skills that you would be using in a history class, that they can apply to daily life. They are um, to make them a little bit more uh, relatable, make it easier for students to understand. So there's different examples for, um, you know, how, how we could, um, use this outside of a history class. We've got um, 
these excellent, what did you call them, Paul? Badge uh, guides. Those the badge guides, I think. Yes. So let's, yeah. for example, look at um, establish connections between facts, which can be a tricky one. So these yeah, those are really the elementary great. ones, which I actually like better, but uh, the secondary ones are on my site and that's the elementary, but that's cool. They're, they're the same. It's just the examples are from the elementary program. That's all. Oh, okay. I didn't know that there were different ones. That's good to know. Um, so it really just breaks down like in, you know, three easy steps. How do I deal with this question? So I read the statement. I establish my who, what, when, where, what. Um, you know, I find the relevant document and now I describe the connection and it walks you through each of those steps. So it's really um, great for doing that explicit teaching of the intellectual operations rather than kind of presenting it and hoping that the student is going to be able to figure it out themselves, doing like the guiding them through that process. They're super excellent. Plus, um, there's a whole bunch of printable posters. If you want to stick them up all over your classroom, um, those do exist. Oh, it's downloading them and it's as a zip file, so never mind. There are posters. And um, Paul also created a, a whole lot, a whole, whole lot of graphic organizers um, using Google Draw, if I'm not. Google Drawings, if I'm not mistaken. There's a lot of Google Draws in that, um, but that's linked to from the site in the teacher section up top and also the students. Basically, it's whatever, whatever, it's from everywhere. Every time we make an organizer, I try to organize, stick it there. So you'll have the colored ones are often Google Drawings. Some of them are PDFs from other, other kits and it's really yep. a storehouse. So it's just a hodgepodge of things and from different, but there it's useful to go through for sure. For sure. So tons of stuff to help students um, practice the intellectual operations. Plus, he's put them in action, as he's already shown you, on that secondary history website. So definitely dive into that later. Um, so uh, when students are performing these intellectual operations, obviously, they have to be interacting with a whole bunch of different documents. Um, and there's lots of different kinds of documents that students are interacting with. Um, so what I wanted to kind of tease out for this part is how can we use digital tools to help students practice these intellectual operations? So I've got uh, a couple of different examples to show. So the first one is doing digital document analysis. So obviously um, students can analyze historical documents on paper, individually, collaboratively, um, but doing it using digital tools can help make it, uh, help make their thinking more visible for um, their peers. And for you as the teacher, you'll have like a trace of what that um, learning that the student is doing. So here are some different examples. So this is using Google Slides, you can use whatever tool you're comfortable with, um, whatever like Microsoft or Google tool, I put some suggestions here. So like if you're Google, using slides, using Jamboard, using Google Docs or drawings. In Microsoft, you can do the same stuff with Class Notebook, PowerPoint Online or Word or Whiteboard. So lots of different options. Um, so students can add comments to different documents. So here's my question, referring to the documents in the next slide, what's the type of government? So um, introduced in 1848. So I put a little, here's my comment, my, making my thinking visible. Okay, so this is taking place after the act of union. And then these three documents that I'm picking through, um, there's a keyword here. Oh, I think this is probably representative document, uh, government, king. That probably might mean that it's a uh, royal government. And then something that's accountable to the people, that's what responsible government means. So it's really making that thinking visible. You as the teacher can see that the student is understanding. Um, you don't just see like the end result. Um, you kind of you see how they got there. 
and you're teaching them to um, to put that thinking on on I was going to say on paper, but make that thinking visible. Other things you can do using shapes is really cool for analyzing historical images. So I've got two images right here. Um, and I just looked at the legend and I can see, you know, um, what the, what was the question here? Two documents that relate to territory and political structure under the Act of Union. So United Canada was my clue. That's what I circled. And um, United Canada Act of Union, it's when the governor general is in charge of the executive council and the legislative council. So that's what clued me into that. And that's making that thinking visible for me, the teacher. Other things, the good old highlight. If you have students collaborating, they can each choose a different color that they're using to highlight to pick out that important information. Again, that thinking is visible. I, as the teacher, can see what's going on. Um, I can have my student add text boxes, just like they would add, add like maybe a comment on their document package. They might like write a little note to themselves, like they could with a comment, they could put it in a text box, whatever works for them, lots of different ways to show thinking. They can use all of the strategies at once, comments, uh, circ like shapes, highlights, whatever works for them. And um, like Paul has created the different examples, I showed all those graphic organizers. I can create a graphic organizer myself in Google Slides or using Google Draw. So this might be how my student is interacting with this question, establishing causal connections, the thing that's happening first leads to this, leads to this, and I want them to add in more of an explanation for how that works. Okay. And like I mentioned earlier, I, lo I love the idea of having students share a verbal explanation of their analysis using Flipgrid or like whatever screencasting tool. Um, because again, it's making that thinking visible. They're walking you through the process that they took to solve that question, to, to get to that answer. Um, and that could be super helpful for you as the teacher, or if your whole class is, you know, answering on Flipgrid and they're dealing with different questions and the students can look over and, and watch what other people did, how they got to that answer, that can be super helpful as well. Next one, and sorry, I haven't been looking at all the comments. Um, yes, voice thread, that's an option. I'm not sure if it's still free. Uh, Flipgrid is um, owned by Microsoft, but Google and Microsoft users can use it. All righty. So next one here, creating maps. Of course, on the exam, students are going to be um, interacting with a lot of maps, but what could be even cooler um, and really help to kind of bring that knowledge to the forefront is if they are making their own maps as part of their learning. That'll really help them situate in space, right? That one of those intellectual operations. So lots of different tools that you can use to do this. Um, one of the ones that I really like is, for example, uh, Google Earth. So Google Earth will bring you on like a 3D tour. Um, let's see, I'm going to try and click it. It does take a hot second to load. Um, but it would really, it can really help students get a sense of, um, you know, where all of these different historical events are taking place, these different places that they're learning about. Let's say throughout the semester, they might be adding some things to um, a map as they're going and, and give them the, the big picture. So here we've got our whole map of Canada. This is where we're starting out, zooming us in. So we're looking at Ottawa here. You can add uh, different elements of text. You can link out to outside sources. And it's kind of like taking me on a tour here, moving me across Canada. 
zooming me in on different places and giving me information as I'm going. So this is one that's created by Canadian Geographic, um, but I put um, the link up here. Uh, will kind of like explain to you how you could do that yourself uh, if you're creating a resource for your students to go through or for your students to build their own. Google My Maps, similar tool, also built by Google, except it's more um, sort of like uh, cartography or not like getting like the 3D vis visual. Thank you, Brampton Library. Um, so here is an example of some Google Maps that have been created, historical maps. Well, it's not letting me make this bigger. Let me try a different one. Arctic Expedition. So here we go. So this map, I uh, can draw, I can put different points on the map. I can draw a shape. This is the route that people took to go from point A to point B. Um, and I can add like text along uh, with it as well. I can have different things pop up and give me more information on that map as I'm going along. And um, so these, both of these tools can be used individually or collaboratively as well. You can have multiple people working on a map at the same time. Uh, and if you are not a Google board, uh, we have Learns Cartograph. Um, which if you want to hear more about that, please talk to Paul about it. <laughs> it's very similar to how um, Google My Maps works. Um, so here's an example. So again, you can have lots of different um, points on the map. You can make it an, uh, an activity for your students to get through. So like Paul has like a couple of essential questions. They've got tasks. They've got some documents to work through as they're comparing the maps of the two rebellions and learning different information along the way. So rather than just the student is kind of reading this thing, a text learning about this time, they're navigating through it as they're like going through a map and they're, they're developing that, that situation in time skill at the same time as they're learning information, which is super cool. Um, ditto for uh, the, the maps, as for timelines, it's cool that students can interact with ones that are pre-existing, but even cooler if they can make their own. Um, so teachers or student making, making their own. A um, couple of different tools we can use to make uh, interactive timelines. Microsoft Sway is an interesting one that I have, I wanted to create my own example, but I didn't have time. So I put a little video. If you're a Microsoft user, you wanna learn how to make an interactive timeline using Sway. Um, this is a tutorial from uh, a teacher who like walks you through from point A to point B, how to do that. You can also um, make one on uh, Google Slides or Microsoft PowerPoint. So here's one that was like pre-created if you want to use um, this is like a roller coaster, but you can you can kind of make your own template with different points in time. There are also other tools like um, Genially or H5P that a student can use. So I'll show you I'll show you Genially. Paul kind of showed us a Genially briefly earlier today. Da, 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 da. So here's an example. And different parts of it are clickable. So we get more information, pictures or text um, as we're working through that timeline. So it could be a great way for, again, the student to be learning something in your class if this is something that you make or that they're preparing at the end of a unit to review. They're, re they're reviewing all of the points in time that they've learned. They can create their own interactive timeline um, and share it with you, share it with their classmates to demonstrate their learning. The last one that I wanted to talk about is using forms. Um, so even though the exams that we're going to be dealing with are 
going to be less multiple choice, like basically no couple of them are sort of multiple choice E, but it's going to involve a lot more uh, writing for students. Um, so even though forms um, is kind of like optimized for multiple choice question, there is still a way for us to use forms that will give automatic feedback to students, um, even if they're writing text, which is, which is more subjective. So I'm going to show you an example that I created using Google Forms. Um, I did try to make the same thing in uh, Microsoft Forms, but sadly, it just is not up to par with Google Forms right now. So if you are going to make an interactive form with feedback built in, I do recommend using Google Forms for now. So here is my example. I have um, my first setting is I've got, uh, it's automatically taking students' email. So it's gonna send them um, their responses right away as soon as they submit the quiz. So here is my first question. This one is a multiple choice. There's two types of questions when I was looking through all the examples that the ministry provided, situate in time and space and establish connections between facts. So that um, that example that Alex showed in the pretest with like which one is federal, which one is provincial, that is sort of a multiple choice E type of question and situate in time and space where they have to identify something in a map or put something in chronological order, say, those we can do um, super easily in forms. So I have, I'm using the same kind of document package that I already prepared. I put the link to it. So when it would be in view mode, a student could just click view that document package. Now they're coming to answer it in the, the form. But I did also put those, if they wanna, I did put the, the documents right here, but they're a little small. So that's why I linked outside if, stu if a student wants to see it a little bit bigger. I also stuck in those beautiful um, little grids. So voila, all of my questions, they're here. This is what it looks like uh, for the student. I filled in this quiz myself as a test to see what it would look like. So here are the responses that I, that I selected as a student and it turns out they were right. So I, I had some feedback that I stuck in there, well done. Next question, this one involved, uh, I had to write a little something. So the feedback here that I added, you're on the right track if your answer included something like this. So the student isn't necessarily, it's not gonna mark them as right or wrong, but the student will have a sense of, was I on the right track with my answer? Was I really in left field with my answer? Because here's, it's, it's supposed to be something like this. Same for the rest of these. And for some of them, I even included, so here's ones that I, I edited this question, so I marked it, it was marked wrong. For some of the questions, um, I even added uh, external resources. So I've got some videos for students to watch if they're not sure about you know, the rebellions of 1837, 1838, and how that led to responsible government. Here's some external resources that they can consult. They can watch a couple videos. They can read one of these articles about whatever that is, and they can correct themselves. Uh, because obviously, um, you know, especially when, if we're um, individualized, uh, teaching in an individualized setting, it's hard to be everywhere at once um, and correcting takes a lot of time. So I was thinking of how can we make this so that um, students can get some fast feedback um, on their learning. Using and about form. feedback, uh, Nancy has a question in the chat. Do you have the feedbacks pre-created for the answers? Okay. I do, yeah. So the second, um, the second the student fills in the quiz and submits it, they get an email um, that links them 
to uh, it'll tell them like this is basically what it what it sends them. It sends them an email, view your results here, and this is what it shows up as for the student. So like you got this question wrong uh, or right, here is the feedback. Um, I, as the teacher for these written ones that don't have a right or wrong answer that I can that I can automatically correct, I would need to read it. It won't mark it as them getting a point for it. I would then kind of go back and see. Um, so this is Emily's response. I can go and mark right or wrong and it'll update, but that it doesn't matter if it takes me a little bit longer to get to that and I just have to add the points because they'll have gotten that feedback. You are on the right track if your answer included something like this. And so they'll know if they were like, oh, I didn't put anything about responsible government in my answer. So I did not get this question right. Yeah. So for those, I put an example of what it looks like from the student perspective. And then I also included a link um, for you to make a copy in your own Google Drive if you want to play around and see like the back end of how that works or you want to test it out yourself. Um, you can you can do that. And voila, that is the little intellectual operations guide, thinking about how we can have students practice those skills using different digital tools. Thank you, Emily. Any questions with regard to uh, what was just presented? Of course, this is very, very digital and very, I mean, to me, this is expert work. Uh, and I'm learning as I go, and I, I I do rely on Emily to help me out, and so on and so forth. But this to me is like, oh my God, this is awesome! But it, I'm nowhere near that, right? But I'm getting there, and I'm sure some people uh, are on the uh, you know the same place I am, saying, okay, I want to learn, and those are awesome, awesome tools to learn and to to play around with and and get your bearings when it comes to uh, a little bit more digital and then incorporate it in your in your classes and then get better at it and maybe someday get closer to Emily's expertise you never know you never know but if you do need Emily that's exactly what she is uh, there for Paul I'm just figuring out how to put up my hand um, I just don't want people to be spooked by it too much because it's not as don't don't reinvent the wheel. If you see see one that looks like what you want, copy it and then just start clicking mm -hmm. around it and change the text. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the idea with uh, the graphic organizers as we make them for different reasons, very different reasons. You know, they just, I just store them there, but they could be elsewhere. They could be Emily's. If you see Emily's, just copy it and change it. Once you've done four or five, it just just changing the text, you'll see. Oh well, I can do that myself, and it becomes yeah. faster mm -hmm. you doing it than copying other people's. But there's so many of them, and it also goes for those evaluations, right? Those uh, those little uh, little circles. Sometimes, how do you get that little circle in there? Just just copy the one you want, the format of the question, change the change the content, and uh, and um, do it that way. It's not it's not uh, difficult to copy other people's. You're stuff. right. Thank you, Paul, for that uh, reassuring comment. Um, Alex and I have uh, have two little things that we want to show you. Uh, they are um, tools that you can use to create maps and also uh, to create documents uh, like schemas and schemes and stuff like that. So I'm going to let Alex start with his uh, creating maps, maps with GIMP. Well, GIMP, it's a software I had used many years, didn't explore very much, but it's very convenient if you want to... Um, to make your own maps and uh, also to modify images uh, with small things that you might need, uh, small changes you might need to make. It's, uh, the system is different than other um, uh, image editor. It works with different layers and actually you can pack up these layers and uh, modify them, change their, uh, also reduce uh, their how important they are, you can reduce their um, density. The, the, once you master rather well the, the software, you can 
it's used by many professionals and I was quite uh, su surprised because it's very easy to use. You can download it. It's, um, it's, an op it's open source and you, you can install it. There is a version. It's good for Mac OS, Linux, uh, Windows. And you just uh, download it at uh, gimp.org. The next one. So, so you can, the, um, the JPEG is images that you get when you have a picture. The PNG are an image with layers so that you can uh, modify. Um, you can combine images. Uh, you can reduce um, the density of some, of some of the layers there also. So you can put them, uh, you can make them transparent. Like uh, if you want, as an example, some color to appear in the back, you can put the layer in the back of another one and then re uh, make the front one half transparent. And then you will have the, uh, a bit of the color. So the, um, this is one way to work. But what I find very convenient is if you have a mute map, either of Canada, North America, or Quebec, um, it's very easy. So you see, you just take your image, you drag and drop, and it's going to it's gonna appear on the right side as yeah, a layer. Sorry. <laughs> and then you can organize your layers there. You can use the, there's brushing tools and image editing tools. You're going to see these. If you use any image editing tool, you're going to see it's very easy to use them. But what you don't have in other image editors is the layer system. The layer system lets you do so many things. And as an example, once you have a map of Quebec or a map of northeastern part of, of uh, America, you see on this one, I, I created a layer with all the, the, the writing. I created a layer with the color, the yellow color. I created another layer with um, the road of Cartier. So if I want to modify it, I can remove the words. I can remove, um, uh, I could remove the, 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 the pathway that uh, Cartier used. I could remove the, the, the water. So it's very uh, convenient. You can cut off and as an example, sometimes the teachers, once you have your map and I, I put uh, on the website, there is a, a mute map of, uh, of Quebec there. The, um, you can use that map and just put it on the, um, just put it on the, uh, the smart board and write on it. Um, if you want to create a new map as an example for the second industrial phase, and you want to show, you can use the map, put an extra layer and just uh, uh, indicate where the industries are, what type of industries. So you can use the mute map to do that. So the, uh, there's a lot of, and it's very easy. You just put an extra layer with whatever information you want to have there. Can be two, three, four information. And then you want to use it for something else. You just put another layer. As long as you saved in PNG, you're going to always going to be able to manage the layers. Once you save it as a JPEG, then it's uh, everything that's there is uh, is merged into one image, so you can't modify. So it's and I put I I I may I wanted to know how to use it very quickly. It took me, I would say, I really wanted to go in, in depth, and uh, it took me about ten hours maybe to really. I, I I can even, but to use it basic, I would say half an hour is enough, just to use the basics. If you want to do more complex things. So these are the basic tutorials. There are many, very easy to follow, 15 to 20 minutes. If you want something specific on maps, use these three. And then for images and effects, I, I, have, uh, I found these four. Uh, studying this for about 10 hours, I was able to, I'm able to create the, quite the, an important diversity of uh, material there. And, uh, and if you want, you can also create PDF. So as an example, if you have images of a book, 100 pages, you want to make it a PDF, it's difficult to find software where you will be able to do that. Well, GIMP can do it. You just put all your images as layers, and then you, you can export it as a PDF. And you can even adjust the pages the way you want, you know, give them the numbers you want. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite convenient when you want to do it. 
and you're getting the PowerPoint that we just showed you with all the links to all the tutorials as well. So you can uh, experiment. Um, on my side, I am I, I'm working more and more with Google Drawings. So um, I'm going to show my two, um, my two links. So I did an active union, very simple. You'll see it's very, very simple. Um, I did a, 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 just a graphic organizer of the active union, as you can see here, very simple, nothing complicated, uh, just, you know, putting boxes, linking them, changing the borders and so on and so forth. Very easy to use. But then some people may say, oh, okay, c'est bien beau, but how do I get to that? I'm not even you know, familiar with the, the, uh, the site itself. Well, in my slide, I put Google Drawings, the complete overview for beginners and using Google Drawings for infographics. So if you wanna push it a little further, you can do that as well with the help of those uh, videos and tutorials. So this was pretty much, uh, a, a, it's an overview of what you can do if you're just starting to play around with these, uh, this material, all the way to what can you do if you're very familiar with uh, digital, uh, digital work and you wanna create uh, extra super spiffy looking material and things that you can really, really push uh, push your, your, yourself towards. I'm, again, learning. I don't have much time to do all that I want to do, but definitely those are, are very helpful. And, and, um, and I get to learn, I get to be inspired. And this was pretty much the idea behind um, the work that we did since uh, January. It was to bring together material from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum and try to reach out to as many people people as possible with the material and try to um, try to re reduce the anxiety of the new program and what what do I do and how can I it's not we're not reinventing the wheel as Paul said earlier it's not necessary either for you to reinvent the wheel there's much more uh, leeway and the student is much more at the center of of it's of his or her learning with the new program. The evaluation is a little different, but as we put together the quiz, either the quiz with form or the paper, you know, pencil paper type of, of pretest, you see that things are really taking shape and, and that the modeling is the same. Even Emily's quiz online had the same type of rubrics referring to document files. The questions had to do with uh, intellectual operation. So we're working with the same, pretty much the same material, but really in different ways. So what you're going to now have access to is every single thing we've uh, presented uh, this afternoon. It'll be, as I said, in a file that you can receive. It'll be on the Age Resource website, so the Akipshak Pedagogical website. You had in the, in the chat an opportunity to click and uh, download the material as you went. And from this point onward, we are also available for extra help to go in into an extension of what we showed you today and put that into practice. So whatever is curriculum, implementation of curriculum and so on, you refer, you can refer to me, you can refer to Emily for uh, the digital material. Alex also is a une mine de savoir. I mean, he's uh, very knowledgeable about so many things. So uh, he's also willing to help in uh, any capacity that, that he can. So you have here the contact information for uh, the three of us. And of course, for Paul, who is also une mine de savoir, but online. Uh, and you have a feedback form that we would really like for you to fill. It takes a few minutes. It's going to help us go from there and see what we can improve on, what else you need also, because there's a question on there uh, on in terms of what you would need as far as further furthering all of this and uh, working with, uh, you know, working in groups, putting together 
work groups, whatever you need, you just reach out to us and it'll be our pleasure to help uh, in any possible way. Questions before we let you go. <laughs> it's a lot. I know it's it was very information heavy, uh, but we really wanted to give you as much as we could to at least get started and uh, maybe use a few of the things we showed you to start putting together your, uh, your classes, your lessons, your units. I know some, some school boards have already arranged for meetings and uh, have already looked into uh, meeting to put together uh, material to implement and so on. So please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Yes, Nicole. Um, just wanted to ask, everything that you guys shared today is public. Um, I heard mm -hmm. it like a few times. Can we build a Moodle course out of everything, like out of all the content that you guys gave us is amazing, like amazing, but or can we build our own space in our school board to like force her students down the path we want them to go? Well, as far as what I put in, as far as my my share of it, my material is concerned, I have no problem with uh, with that, of course. Uh, I don't know. I can't speak for Emily and Alex, but as far as I'm concerned. Okay, Emily's saying go. Is yep. fine. <laughs> Alex is saying go. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Everything you guys see makes is Creative Commons for educational use. What I would ask, actually, if if whatever you put together, and it could be anyone else, of course, not just Nicole, but in general, if you put something together, share, just, you know, let us know uh, that there is something out there that you've put together. And I'm sure that uh, a lot of people can benefit from all of your effort into putting things together and making your making all of this your own. And uh, there's nothing I like I love more than seeing people move move on and put put things together. And then the sharing is already amazing in our community. So we want to encourage that. So the more we hear back from you, the better off we'll be. So uh, that would be awesome. Comments Just to add are... to that, Judy is talking about sharing. So I'm going to mm -hmm. tell you about where you can share. Yep. So on the HD You're faster than I am. Site, <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. Um, <laughs> here's the, the History of Quebec and Canada page where you can yep. find all of the, all these lovely links. Mm -hmm. This is the teacher contribution page. Brings you to a Padlet for all of the social sciences courses. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there's a lovely history section. Mm -hmm. You just click the pop plus, add whatever it is you want to add. Also, on Moodle FJA, um, Rissi, we've created a an Anglo community page um, that everyone can come and join. We've got tons of different tiles. Um, so one specific to individualized multi-level teaching, but also for all the social sciences, we've got forums for each of the different programs that exist, links to exterior resources. Um, so if you ever have, you know, questions or ideas, um, you know, about, um, uh, you know, resources that you're finding, whatever, and you want to share them with people and start a discussion with fellow teachers, um, feel free to, to jump into the community yep. to do that. I'll share the tutorials if you're interested in joining. Um, there's two very short tutorials that can walk you through how to make an account and contribute to forums. Um, because yeah, let's, let's connect people across the province and mm -hmm. share all that good stuff that's going on. Yep. Yeah, make something good of that pandemic that made us have to work online so much. Well, I mean, look at what we can do. Thank you very much for being here, everyone. We appreciate it. You don't you have no idea how much we appreciate your presence here this afternoon. And uh, please reach out to us anything you need. And if it's not, if we're not able, we're going to redirect you to the person who can help you. So uh, 
again, thank you very much and have a pleasant rest of day, everyone.